What's good, Josh? Boy Ross back at it again with another video. So we're gonna check out ranking the nine versions of The Rock from worst to best by none other than Wrestling Flashback. This should be a good one. The Rock has definitely, uh, I guess you can say, had his different type of phases and what he was going through when he was in WWE, and uh, we, you know, we were able to be, a, we were treated to seeing the different transformations of The Rock. He went from the Goody Two Shoes Babyface and uh, Rocky Maivia, I believe that's what uh, his name. We went by Rocky Maivia, which people did not like at all to the corporate rock the trash talking rock you know it, it was just cool to see his transformation of his character slight iterations of it and uh we, we were entertained by it so we're gonna check this out appreciate all the love and support let's get right into this one, one two, this is on the Rock has had his fair share of personas over the years, mm -hmm. consistently switching between both heel and babyface, and being one of the most entertaining characters on the show in the process. As regardless of what role he played, the core of his character rarely changed, but he was still able to make you cheer him or even boo him. Mm -hmm. And over time, fans have certainly done both when witnessing the different eras of The Rock. So today, we're ranking the different versions of The Rock through the years. Number nine, Rocky Maivia, yep, November Rocky 96 Maivia. to August 97. As great as The Rock we all know and love would become, he certainly had had a difficult start despite an impressive first outing. As he would be thrown in at the deep end, debuting in a traditional five on five elimination match at the 1996 Survivor Series, going by the name Rocky Maivia, a combination of his father and grandfather's ring names. But being wrestling's first ever third generation superstar proved at first to be a hindrance more than a benefit. Rocky Maivia was a blue chipper, white meat babyface, and it was clear that he had gifted athletic ability and was well trained in the ring. But Rocky lacked character, yeah. and his clean cut persona was poorly received by the fans who jeered Maivia out of arenas with chance like Rocky sucks and crowd signs that read die Rocky die a run with the Intercontinental Championship wasn't going to be enough as Rocky needed a fresh coat of paint and fast. With the Monday Night Wars kicking into high gear during this period, wrestling was on its way to becoming more edgier. So a good looking straight face baby face wasn't going to work. fly anymore as we move towards a new era. Number eight, special guest, 2003 to 2004. In 2003, The Rock would take his longest break from the ring to that point in order to star in movies such as The Rundown and Walking Tall. Between films, Rock would still make sporadic appearances on WWE television such as in December 2003 to save former tag team partner Mick Foley from an attack by La Resistance. <laughs> Rock would also appear in a segment with Eugene, return to Raw in his hometown of Miami, and he hosted a Diva Search pie-eating contest. These moments were still entertaining, but if anything, they reminded fans of what they were missing, mm -hmm. as these one-off appearances showed how The Rock was still a level above everyone on the mic. And this was without doubt Hollywood's gain, as Rock's unmatched wrestling charisma translated well to the big screen in both films he starred in during 2003 and 2004. The Rock wrestled one more match during this period as the Rock and Sock Connection teamed up for the last time in a handicap match. Oh, oh man. And Sock Connection. Oh, Take me back. Against Randy Orton, Batista, and Ric Flair at WrestleMania 20. The WWE would allow The Rock's contract to expire at the end of the year without so much as even a phone call from Vince McMahon. And perhaps this fueled the fire in regards to Dwayne Johnson distancing himself from the rock name and the WWE as a whole. Number seven, mm. joining the nation, August 97 to March 98. The Nation of Domination was a group that thrived under the leadership of Ron Simmons, mm -hmm. but it was the rock that quickly became the faction's most popular and over member. <laughs> All rock needed was a microphone in his hand. In arenas across the country, I heard chants of Rocky suck. And this is, this is, this is what you need. This is what you need. They should have did this with Roman Reigns much sooner. This is what you you got to pull an audible, especially on someone you have high hopes for. If the crowd's not feeling it, pull an audible, pull an audible. That way you're able to see if they can be a heel because people, if they're already booing you now and you're a good guy, you might as well turn heel, see what you can do with that. People want us a people like the bad guy. They want to be able to hate you. And then afterwards, They'll end up loving you because they hate you. It's weird how <laughs> we work as human beings. We 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 tend to stray away from the goody two shoes, but we love the villain. And then eventually we want to cheer for the villain. It's weird. But sucks isn't one of them. 
Rock's heel turn made the WWF realize that they had something special with the mm -hmm. former Rocky Maivia, who is now exclusively known as The Rock. Rock. It was one of wrestling's great career turnarounds as Rock established himself as one of the Federation's biggest heels, as he held the Intercontinental title for a second time, featuring in memorable feuds with Steve Austin mm -hmm. and Ken Shamrock. The nation gave Rock a chance to effectively develop his character and build upon the natural charisma he had that didn't get the opportunity to shine through during the Rocky Maivia days. As a heel, his confidence also improved. Rock's yep. natural aptitude in the ring was now combined with impressive mic skills and growing main event potential. Number six, Boots to Asses. February 2011 to April 2014. The Rock made his long-awaited return to WWE in 2011. In order to build up a feud with John Cena, which ultimately lasted for over two years, they would main event WrestleMania three years in a row together, which included two matches against each other at WrestleMania 28 and 29, with both proving to be massive financial successes for WWE. While for fans, it was a dream come true to see such icons of the sport finally face off on the biggest of stages, especially given The Rock went into his second bout with Cena as the WWE Champion after capturing the title for the first time in 11 years at the 2013 Royal Rumble, defeating CM Punk to end an over year-long championship reign. Yep. One critique for The Rock during this period were perhaps his promos. He was still able to cut some of his best though, including one that didn't even air on WWE television. But there were times when Rock's material was lacking, with Cena even getting the better of him on the microphone mm -hmm. on a few occasions. And that's the crazy thing. It, it, there was... He was getting, they actually was uh, having some uh, legit heat with each other because Cena would be like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's crazy how you, you got to come out here and write the, your your notes, your promos on your wrist because you don't remember them anymore. You ain't, you ain't got it like you used to. Like he was burying him. He was breaking the fourth wall. So they were having some legit tensions backstage because of that shit. Like, what the fuck are you doing? You know what I'm saying? But it, it overall worked. And for my video, uh, one of the bit, my top 10 favorite WrestleManias of uh, WrestleMania matches of all time. This definitely, uh, their first go about, that definitely would have been one of my honorable mentions. It's not my favorite. It's a great, great legendary match. It's just, it, there's just other matches that I just really, really enjoy and more, uh, enjoy, enjoy a lot. But this, their first go around definitely would have probably been the 11th spot for sure. And after April 1st, you won't be making no more movies. You gonna need surgery on your face just like you had it on your boobies. Either way, when it came time to turn it on at the show of shows, The Rock definitely delivered with two top performances yeah. in each of he and Cena's WrestleMania main events. And this is despite the fact Rock suffered torn abdominal and abductor muscles, as well as a hernia during the second match, <laughs> forcing the wrestlers to go home early. This match acted as a passing of the torch as such, and afterwards, The Rock would once again leave for Hollywood. Over the next few years, The Rock would continue to show up on WWE TV every now and then, including at the following three WrestleManias, with the People's Champ even wrestling mm -hmm. at Mania 32, <laughs> in what technically counts as a match, although it only lasted six seconds, which became a record for the shortest match in WrestleMania history. Number five, Undisputed Champion, June 2002, to August 2002. Following WrestleMania 18 in 2002, The Rock would leave WWE for a short time whilst continuing to pursue his acting career. Rock would return that summer being thrusted straight into the undisputed title picture alongside Kurt Angle and champion at the time, The Undertaker. And the great one would manage to defeat the two to claim the title at the Vengeance pay-per-view in a stellar triple threat match. The People's Champ would be best remembered during this period, however, for his mm -hmm. match with Brock Lesnar in the main event of SummerSlam. Yep. Rock faced a massive test in the undefeated Brock who had quickly skyrocketed himself to the top of the card. The Rock would make Lesnar look like a million bucks and put him yep. over in a big way, as Brock pinned him clean in the middle of the ring to become the new champion. You know, Dub would hate to see this clip, but it needed to happen. The Rock wasn't going to be around much anymore, and Brock Lesnar was the guy. At that. He was the next guy up. This match was made even more entertaining by how split down the middle the fans were for both mm -hmm. competitors. As the crowd knew, The Rock was set to leave for Hollywood again following the show and made their feelings known. The Rock has always been one to play off the crowd, the way he worked as heel at Mania 18 is a prime mm -hmm. example. And this was no different at SummerSlam as he cut a heel promo on the fans after the match. A foreshadowing for the Hollywood Rock character yep. that was still to come. As of now, sing along with The Rock is over. 
Although Rock's run as Undisputed Champion proved to be brief, it did treat us to some great matches, as it was clear that Rock was still at the top of his game on the mic and in the ring, despite now only wrestling for the WWE on a part-time basis. Number 4 Leading the Nation March 98 to October 98 The Rock's career resurgence after joining the Nation of Domination allowed us to see what the Great One was truly capable of. It soon became clear that The Rock was on a slow burn to eventually becoming the leader of the nation. Yep. After weeks of bickering between the two, The Rock would finally overthrow Farouk as the leader of the Nation of Domination on the night after WrestleMania 14. From there, Rock would defeat Farouk at Over the Edge 1998. While joining the nation allowed The Rock to be himself and come out of his shell, becoming the group's leader allowed him to turn his personality all the way up to 11, as he fired on all cylinders whenever he got on the mic. The Rock is going to raise his big right hand. He's going to raise the people's eyebrow. He's going to lay the smack down on both candy asses. And as The Rock was leading the nation through 1998, Triple H was doing the same on the babyface side with D-Generation X. This meant that it was only natural for the two factions to feud, with the two mm -hmm. leaders going up against one another. Rock and Triple H <laughs> developed great chemistry in the ring. This yep. coupled with the real-life competitive rivalry the two shared led to them having some very good matches, which were topped off with an excellent ladder match at SummerSlam 98. There was no denying they were both on the path to superstardom. The Rock's incredible charisma was endearing him more and more to the fans, to the point where he'd essentially become a babyface by the time Mark Henry and D'Lo Brown turned on him in the fall of 98. And that's the thing, bro. When you're so charismatic, and people want to boo you at some point it switches it's like yo i like this guy even though he's a bad guy i like him and eventually they had to turn him okay. this put the final nail in the coffin to the nation which was nearing its natural end as rock had already been riding solo in the prior months having outgrown the faction so after initially being universally rejected as rocky maivia the first time around the rock was now a well-supported babyface for the first time in his career number three corporate rock corporate november 98 rock, yeah. to may 99 I the rock ran the gauntlet the during rock. the 1998 survivor series defeating three wrestlers on his way to the final of the deadly game tournament eventually winning the wwe UF Championship for the first time. Rock began the night as a massive babyface with the fans firmly in his corner, but there was still a massive swerve to come. And it came mm -hmm. when Vince McMahon ended the match after the Rock locked Mankind in the sharpshooter, just like Shawn Michaels did to Bret Hart in Montreal 12 months prior. And just like then, Vince would call for the bell without any submission ever occurring. The Rock had suddenly gone from a top baby face mm -hmm. to a top heel overnight in no small part thanks to Vince. Decked out in flashy shirts and designer sh- Bro, The Rock was drippy. He was drippy. The latest and greatest of Versace drip, designer drip, he was dripped out. Shades, The Rock continued to raise his game even further, and now with the WWF title in his possession, the sky was the limit. Rock's first test as champion was Mankind in what would go down as one of wrestling's mm -hmm. greatest feuds. Greatest with such feuds. classics like their halftime heat empty arena match, the Raw match where Mankind won his first WWF championship, mm -hmm. and the violent I Quit match at the 1999 yep. Royal Rumble. Oh my, oh my god. These unforgettable matches will go down as some of the best entertainment the WWF has ever produced, featuring two of the company's greatest mm. ever superstars. Great this rivalry feud. added a ruthless edge to The Rock that would help him continue to reach new heights and put him in the prime position to take on the man that would become his greatest rival of all, Stone, Stone Cold, Cold Steve Austin. This was the biggest match the WWF had to offer as the company's two biggest stars headlined WrestleMania 15 and then followed it up with a spectacular rematch at the following month's Backlash show. The WWF had two all-time greats on their hands at the mm -hmm. same time and each man's battle and desire to be the very best made for some unmissable television, Facts. which built to must-buy pay-per-views. All in all, Corporate Rock proved to be the persona that sealed the Great One's transition from popular upper mid-carder to genuine main eventer, and provided a perfect platform for the outrageous success that was soon to follow. Number two, Hollywood, Hollywood Rock. Rock. February Love 2003 this version of The Rock, man. So great. The fans' resentment towards Rock leaving for Hollywood was on display during the SummerSlam 2002 main event. And if it wasn't clear that The Rock needed to return as a heel, it was undeniable by the start of 2003 when a taped video promo he cut was booed out of the building during the Raw 10th anniversary show. This was surely the catalyst to pull the trigger on what would be known as the Hollywood Rock character. Mm -hmm. As The Rock returned, sporting a new haircut, 
Tattoo, and Entrance Music. Rock Hogan 2 at No Way Out 2003 gave us a heel rock versus a face Hogan, something we had gotten a taste of at WrestleMania 18 yep. a year prior when the fans turned on the Great One. The Rock now embraced the booze and considered himself as being above wrestling, given how much of his stock was rising as an actor. This new persona gave us some of the best promos and yes. funniest moments of Rock's career. It was clear to see how much fun he was having. The fans ate it up so much that they eventually began to cheer him again because <laughs> that's the crazy thing bro he was fucking hilarious and you had no other choice but to laugh and it was so fucking good bro the stuff he had with hurricane bro oh my god the ham burglar caught the man the ham because he was just so entertaining he's so good watch this watch this whoa Rock could even bury the fans and still get cheered. Yep. This resulted in a hilarious line quipped by Vince McMahon backstage as he said that Rock was shitting on the crowd, but he's shitting ice cream. The Hollywood Rock run was a brief one given Rocky's movie commitments, but the great one was still able to deliver us some truly epic segments such as the Rock concert, the infamous Toronto promo, spinning in the face of Hogan, mm -hmm. the epic final battle with Austin at WrestleMania, mm -hmm. the backstage running and eventual <laughs> match with the Hurricane, as well as the epic standoff with Goldberg. Yep. All this packed into what was perhaps the most compelling run of Rock's career, possibly making Hollywood Rock the greatest short-term gimmick in wrestling history. Fantastic. Number one, the People's, the People's Champion, Champ. May 1999 to March yep. 2002. As one of the main stars of the Attitude Era, The Rock had become so entertaining that it was almost impossible to dislike. And this was seen through the reactions he drew each week, which meant it was time to pull the trigger on him as a top babyface. Yep. And it was the babyface turn that allowed The Rock to reach his undisputed peak. It's me, Mark Lloyd. Oh, it's me, Mark Lloyd. It's your dad, God, shut up. <laughs> while Rock remained cocky and arrogant, the fans loved him for it because yep. of how much they could get involved in the catchphrases and promos. Yep. And once the bell rang, they would be on the edge of their seats as Rock's matches electrified the sold-out arenas who all came to see the great one. During 1999, The Rock would even take a back seat from the world title picture. And despite not being in the main event, Rock remained the highlight of each show by still yep. cutting promos like no other and by featuring in Hill. And that's when you know your star power is beyond the title. When you don't need the title, and you're the most, one of the most entertaining and sought out segments of the show. And you don't need the title to be that. It kind of, it kind of reminds me of Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins hadn't had a championship in quite some time. But he is arguably the best thing on Monday Night Raw. And has been for almost two plus years. He doesn't need the title. The same thing here with The Rock. He didn't need the title at one point. You just wanted to see him. Because he was that over. Hilarious segments, like the time he buried Billy Gunn. Bob, but my name, name is Billy. Billy. It, it doesn't, doesn't matter what your name, name is. is. Or who could forget the countless hilarious moments involving the Rock and Sock connection? It didn't make a difference who he worked with. Anything involving the Rock turned to gold. So it yep. was only a matter of time until he had the WWF Championship gold in his possession again. And he would end up holding the title for much of 2000, where in the absence of Stone Cold, mm -hmm. the Rock star shone even brighter. So much so that the People's Champ would get his first taste of Hollywood around this time. And right from the jump, it was clear, Rock was a natural. Rock's legendary feud with Triple H in 2000 gave us multiple incredible matches and was followed up with a second feud with Stone Cold, two years on from their mm -hmm. first WrestleMania match. Rock and Austin were neck and neck, but some may argue that the Great One had now overtaken Austin given how good of a year the People's Champ had in the Rattlesex absence. True or not, what is for sure is that there were no superstars more deserving of wrestling in the final match of the Attitude Era as Rock and Austin closed Batch. out WrestleMania 17 with a five-star classic. Following 17, filming began for The Scorpion King, which was The Rock's first feature role in a movie, and the film's box office success, as well as the praise for The Rock's performance, was a big sign that ultimately, Rocky yeah. wouldn't be long for the wrestling world. Rock continued working part-time and led the WWF to victory as they defeated the Alliance at the end of 2001. The following year's WrestleMania at the Sky Dome Toronto acted as the perfect ending to this era of The Rock. As Hogan passed the torch to Rock in the dream match of all dream matches. Yep. The 68,000 fans reaction to the two icons doing battle made this one of the- This definitely was also one of the honorable mentions I did not uh, uh, put in the video because it's just so many good honorable mentions. Most memorable encounters in WWE history. The crowd cheering the heel Hogan whilst booing the babyface Rock resulted in the two switching roles with The Rock 
working the match as a heel on his way to victory in what proved to be a passing of the torch moment as Rock was part of another all-time great WrestleMania moment when he and Hogan shook hands and posed after the match. All in all, it doesn't matter which version of the Rock you prefer because each one was able to just bring it while putting yep. boots to asses, ultimately allowing the people's champion to become the most electrifying man in all of entertainment. The Rock knew his role in the world of wrestling, but he certainly didn't shut his mouth. His role was to finally become perhaps the best damn WWF champion there ever was. Defeating Rudy Poos and Jabronis <laughs> and laying the smack down on candy asses. And that's something the Rock guarantees. Because anyone that did dare to go one-on-one -on -one with the Great One, he would take you down to Know Your Roll Boulevard, which is yep. on the corner of Jabroni Drive, yep. and check you directly into the Smackdown Smack Hotel, Hotel, where yep. they're known to serve nice pie if you smell what the Rock is cooking. <laughs> so in 10 seconds, and the Rock means 10 seconds, the millions and millions of the Rock's fans Love chanting it. his name. And that brings us to the end of this video. Oh, As always, man. if you enjoyed the this video... This is a great video, man. Gonna go ahead and give this one a like. If you haven't already, go subscribe to Wrestling Flashback, man. The Rock is goaded. He'll forever be goaded. One of the best to ever do it. Easily one of my top five favorite wrestlers of all time. Dude is just fantastic, man. And I, I the only match I want to see from him, one more match, Tim versus Roman. That's it. That's the only match I care to see from The Rock. No, after that, he can retire. He can retire from wrestling for good. Roman versus The Rock, that needs to happen. The best place in Hollywood. If that, that's the match. That's the match. That is the match, man. But comment down below, let me know what's your favorite version of The Rock. But I appreciate all the love and support you guys have been showing on the channel. Road to 100K. Appreciate y'all kicking me. See y'all next one.